Welcome to the Burden and Blessing Podcast, a study and discussion forum on the truth of God's Word. Our review series examines books, movies, music, and other media in the light of God's truth. We pray that it will be eye-opening, instructional, and beneficial for your daily walk with Christ. Welcome back to another Burden and Blessing podcast. I am Pastor Ben Libby, and with me on the phone here today is Pastor Nathaniel Mayhew. And today we're going to be going through another hymn, continuing in the season of the church year we are in. We are going into the Christmas season. Of course, there are many hymns that we could choose to review. But we chose to review hymn 95 in our Lutheran hymnal, Savior of the Nations Come. Nathaniel, how are you doing? Very well. Looking forward to talking about this one. Is this him? I know it's in the Christmas section, but is it more Christmassy or Adventy? I kind of think it. You know, you think about Advent, and you know that word means coming. And this, the 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 title of this hymn is "Savior of the Nations Come." It kind of is this in the right section? You know, there are some of the Advent Christmas hymns can go either direction right yeah and and this is one of those that are certainly like you pointed out some really neat adventy themes it talks a lot about the coming of jesus which fits into the advent theme at the same time there's a lot of christmas themes in here too there's there's a lot of emphasis advent will focus on the preparation for the coming of jesus Whereas Advent or Christmas begins to look at the reasons why Jesus came and who Jesus was. And and this hymn is really going to dig into the nature of that babe that was born in Bethlehem, which I think is probably one of the reasons why it would fit and why it's been placed in the majority of hymnals in the Christmas section, even though it has those, it certainly helps us prepare for Christmas with that uh, idea of his coming for us. Yeah, I could almost even see you arguing to put it into Epiphany, you know, Savior of the Nations. So you kind of see that that kind of emphasis as well. But yeah, I think your point is is very well made. It is talking about obviously his birth and who and what Jesus is. So I think it is it's appropriate. You could you could sing it for Advent also, and you know, probably would be appropriate there too. But uh, first, I think uh, very important to know, Nathaniel, and to notice that this is one of the oldest hymns in the entire hymnal. Our hymnal is old, but this hymn is very ancient. Can you kind of talk about uh, what it, when it was written and who exactly was this author of Savior of the Nation Comes, uh, one St. Ambrose? Yeah, you talk about our hymnal being old, Ben. Uh, this hymn puts that concept in perspective because yeah. our our hymnal is you know eighty years old. This this particular hymn is sixteen hundred years old. So Saint wow. Ambrose was one of the great Latin church fathers. And he died in 397. So he he died before we roll into the 400s after the time of Christ. And St. Ambrose is really an interesting character. He was one of the most important of the Latin church fathers. And one of the reasons that he was so important was because he knew both Latin and Greek. So he bridged the the gap. He knew about the Greek church fathers and read the the, the Greek church fathers, but was still primarily in the Latin church. And and so he was important in that regard. He was the Bishop of Milan and he has an interesting history. He was only a Christian for about 20 years. Hmm. He, he followed in his father's footsteps to be involved in government and took classes to be a, a good secular leader. And he was so well regarded in Milan where he was that when the bishop of the church died, they asked him to take his place as the bishop of the church in Milan. The only problem was Ambrose had just started taking catechism classes. He wasn't, he had not been confirmed yet. Oh. And so they sort of did a rush job in order to complete his confirmation classes, they ordained him as a priest and then chose him as a bishop in a very, very short period of time so that he could take the place of this bishop who had died suddenly. And while you might think, well, that was a bad idea, you know, pushing this guy through who really didn't have a very uh, solid Christian foundation, Ambrose became 
a, a solid, solid Christian, and again, was very, very well respected for his character, uh, for his knowledge of scripture as he grew and studied the scriptures for himself. And then, like I said before, he became, becomes one of the most important of the early Latin church fathers from this period in history. And so he actually had connections to some of the other church fathers that we're familiar with as well. And uh, they owe a lot of what they learned and who they became to St. Ambrose. So uh, he was very influential in that regard. You'll notice, I mentioned he was one of the Latin church fathers in the hymnal. You'll notice that this hymn is unique in that, first of all, it was written in Latin. Hmm. So we have the unique feature with this hymn that this has been doubly translated. It was translated from the original Latin of Ambrose. Luther took it and translated it into German and then we have the German version of Luther then translated in our hymnal into English. So um, it is not a direct translation of Ambrose, but it is very faithful. There's one verse of Ambrose's original Latin that does not come through or what Luther translated into German. So we only have seven as opposed to the original eight verses, but still a beautiful, beautiful hymn. This is one of my favorites, Ben, yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as the Christmas section. Yeah, it is really awesome. I, I really like the, the all the history and backstory. I mean, if you're talking about, yeah, a guy who died before the year 400, <laughs> it's going to be, uh, there's a lot of time in between when he wrote it and then when it actually ended up in our hymnal. And then, you know, I think Luther kind of taking it and uh, I think probably identifying with it and grasping onto it and saying, hey, this is something, one of the hymns I need to translate into German really goes to show you just how, you know, important and uh, influential. I think, I guess this, this hymn truly is. I think if it, before we get off the topic, Nathaniel, can you kind of talk about maybe what the state of church history was? Obviously, I mean, we might not know a whole ton about like, you know, the fourth century, but can you take us, take us back to that? And why would Ambrose be, you know, motivated to write a hymn like this? Well, the fourth century was one of the most tumultuous doctrinally in the history of the church. For those who are familiar with uh, old or ancient church history, the fourth century brought the Arian controversy, which was addressed by the Council of Nicaea in 325. And then it also brought an error related to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that was then addressed at the Council of Constantinople in 381 and also going back and readdressing the Arian controversy from the early fourth century. And so while Ambrose wasn't a Christian throughout that whole period, he would have caught the tail end of the Arian controversy and the controversy dealing with the Holy Spirit. And you can really see that he addresses particularly the Arian controversy mm -hmm. in this hymn. The Arian controversy basically was the denial that Jesus was both true God and true man. Uh, Arius, uh, came on the scene and he said, nope, Jesus is man, but he's not true God. He can't be. And so the church addressed that in the Nicene Creed. And and Ambrose addresses that in him fashion mm -hmm. beautifully by reinforcing very, very clearly time and time again, verse after verse, the fact that absolutely Jesus was not just man. He is man, fully man, but at the same time, he was also true gods. And as we go through the hymn, we'll see that come out in the theology that he weaves into this particular hymn. Yeah, I think you can even see it right off the bat here in the in verse number one. So uh, let's just uh, get into this first verse, and then we can kind of discuss uh, some more things and uh, more topics. Um, of course, Savior of the Nations come uh, in the red hymnal is hymn number 95. Savior of the Nations come virgin son make here thy home marvel now O heaven and earth that the lord chose such a birth i think there right there too you have virgin son that's you know clearly i mean well virgin son you can't that can't be talking about anyone else besides the messiah but also you know that's man and then make here thy home that the lord so you have like what you were saying there nathaniel True God, true man, right off the bat. And, and the other neat thing about this hymn 
is that we're going to see that it is once again like we've studied in hymns before it is chock full of references to scripture passages both in the old and the new testament so you mm -hmm. pointed out virgin son well that takes us back to isaiah 7 behold mm -hmm. the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name emmanuel and and you're right you know virgin's son it's interesting in that little phrase right there you have the deity of christ and the humanity of christ sewed together mm -hmm. because he was true man he was the son of a of, of a woman of a virgin but she had not had a relationship with a man which means that this is the doing of god that is bringing this about not implicit emphasizing the fact that jesus is true god but as you point out in the last part of the verse here the lord the lord chose such a birth he chose to be born this demonstrates the fact that he was in existence before he was conceived in the womb of Mary, he is the pre-incarnate, before he becomes flesh, God that is revealing and being spoken of here by Ambrose. And some neat other themes that come out in this first verse, as you talked about earlier, Savior of the nations, the idea of epiphany, that when Jesus comes, Jesus comes as a Savior of all people. This takes us back to, to Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15, where the Lord speaks to Abraham and says, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So again, all of these references, it's the culmination of God's plan of salvation, all brought to fulfillment, to fruition here in the birth of the Son of God through the Virgin Mary. The Lord chose such a birth. And Ambrose calls to the world around, it's not simply the miracle of the fact that a virgin is conceiving here that he's drawing our attention to, but mm -hmm. the fact that this is the God-man who is come to be our savior. That is the, the thing that we are to marvel about in this opening verse. Right. Yeah. I think uh, as far as scripture references go, the one actually listed in the Lutheran hymnal is John 1, 14, which is, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And I think that's certainly here too. Uh, also, I just see, you know, throughout just the, uh, the Luke narrative as well, like the, um, like Gabriel, like you shall call his name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? It means savior you know that's why savior of the nation that's why it's appropriate that you're, you're talking about jesus but i, I don't even know if the, his name gets mentioned in this hymn at all but no yeah, yeah. We, we know we know who it's talking about clearly <laughs> like who else could be the virgin son it's only jesus right well and, and you know you mentioned luke ben and this opening verse reminds me of Luke as well. Look at that last phrase, or the second to last phrase, marvel mm. now, O heaven and earth. That reminds me of Luke chapter 2. Yeah. And what was it that marveled on the night of the birth of Jesus? You have the shepherds, there's the earth, who come to worship the baby Jesus. And then the angels shouting from heaven, heaven and earth rejoicing, marveling at the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. And you mentioned John 1. The reference in our hymnal is John 1, verse 14. But as Ambrose wrote these verses, he had the entire first section of John chapter 1 in, in, the, in his mind. He's mm -hmm. going to refer to John 1, verse 1 later on in one of the other verses, as well as the rejection of mankind, which is brought out in John 1 as well. So that is probably one of the most powerful foundational scripture references for this entire hymn, just the first chapter of John. Well, let's go to the verse number two uh, then not by human flesh and blood by the spirit of our god was the word of god made flesh woman's offspring pure and fresh take us through that nathaniel lots of titles there well this verse takes us to when the angel gabriel appears to mary and mary questions how is it going to be how is it that i'm going to have a child i i don't know a man and the angel speaks to mary and says the holy spirit will come upon you the power of the most high will overshadow you therefore that one who is to be born of you will be called the son of the most high 
And so verse two really digs into that, that prophecy of Isaiah seven that we talked about earlier, the virgin would conceive and bear a son, but then to the words of Gabriel himself as he appears to Mary and confirms what we know to be true. So we can go into Luke, we can go into Matthew, both of those accounts speak about the, the nature of who Jesus would be and how it would, what would come about. But the spirit, we confess this in the creed. Think back again to the Nicene Creed or the Athanasian Creed. What do we confess? That Jesus was conceived in the, the womb of the Virgin Mary by God, the Holy Spirit. He was the one who brought that about. So not only does it tie these truths together from Scripture itself, but it brings in the creeds that had just been professed by the ancient church, acknowledged and united upon, and it draws that into this particular verse as well as a confession of faith of what we believe and how it came about. In the last part of that verse, you mentioned already John 1.14. Yeah. Well, there's where the quote comes from, the word of God made flesh, as you quoted earlier. But that last phrase is an interesting one too. Woman's offspring, pure and fresh. This takes us back to Genesis 3, the mm -hmm. seed of the woman. So you look at how Ambrose is tying all of these biblical prophecies together with the fulfillment and pointing out that this one who would be born would be pure without sin. You think about Hebrews. Jesus suffered all of the things that we suffer, yet he did it without sin. He comes apart from sin in order to redeem those who were in sin under the law. Uh, so just, again, a, just a masterful job of weaving all of these biblical illusions of the Messiah, the coming Savior, together into a beautiful and very profound message and confession. Yeah, there's so many different references here, which, again, is the mark of a really excellent hymn, you know, multiple scripture references and a, a depth of scriptural knowledge, I think that really makes a good for a good hymn. All right, uh, let's get let's move on then to uh, verse number three here. Wondrous birth, O wondrous child, of the virgin undefiled, though by all the world disowned, still to be in heaven enthroned. I like that whole aspect there. You kind of get that virgin undefiled. I think there there's that there's that section of scripture where. I think Pharisees are kind of hinting to Jesus, like not so subtly that he was born of fornication because like we mentioned before, he did not have a human father. And, uh, you know, Jesus, of course, turns that on them. But I think it, it just goes to show you how it's wondrous, right? Wondrous is the thing that gets us into this verse. Jesus didn't have just a regular birth. It was wondrous. Yeah, you know, this takes us back. We talked a little bit about this in the first verse, the marveling. You know, what is it that we're mm -hmm. marveling about? Well, certainly it's the miracle of what takes place here in this particular event. Wondrous birth, but also a wondrous child. This is a child unlike any other. And what's interesting is what Ambrose points out here, that this is a wondrous birth. It's a, it's a miraculous thing. It's a wonderful child. We've got this beauty that's taking place, but what happens? He was disowned by the world. And this takes us back into John chapter 1, where John says that Jesus was in the world. The world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. How sad it is as we look at the mass of humanity to see how many people do not know Jesus as the Savior or who have rejected him as savior. Though by all the world disowned, still it will not stop God's plan of salvation still to be in heaven enthroned. And this is gonna lead us in now to the next two verses mm -hmm. that Jesus comes, he fulfills the purpose that his father has given him to do. And then he returns to the father once again. So this verse too, it implies Jesus is more than just a man. It implies that he has come from heaven and he will return to heaven, which is his proper place as God. Okay, we think we're going to take verses four and five together, and then we'll take verses six and seven together as well. From the Father forth he came, and returneth to the same, captive leading death and hell. High the song of triumph swell. Thou, the Father's only Son, hast or sin the victory won. 
boundless shall thy kingdom be when shall we its glory see i like the fact that you tied these two together because they have some themes that grip on each other you'll notice the first line in both verses from the father forth he came and then verse five thou the father's only son so again we're, we're going back to the fact that jesus is divine it's throughout the gospels we read over and over again he comes from the father and how many times in the gospels do you read jesus speaking about his father Luke chapter 2 later on, Jesus says, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? And he wasn't talking about Joseph. Mm -hmm. He was talking about his heavenly father. He came from the father. He was born of the virgin. And yet we get a glimpse at what his purpose was. He's going to return to the father once he's done with his work. But what is that work? The second part of verse 5, to lead captive death and hell. And then again in verse 5, he has over sin, the victory won. The, the picture that I have in my head here, Ben, is you think about a police officer, and he's uh, just arrested two bad guys. And they're, they're hauling the two bad guys off to prison. And before they haul them off to prison, they lock them away in handcuffs. They've got their hands in handcuffs. They've got their feet in handcuffs. You know, they can barely shuffle along because they, they can't take very long steps, so they can't run. And, and here he is, and he's got, a, he's got his hand on the collars of both of them, you know, as they're walking down the road. He's in control. He's captured them, and he's off to bring them into the slammer. That's the picture that Ambrose paints for us of, of what Jesus has done. He came to earth for the purpose of, of bringing into captivity the enemies of the human being, death and hell. And you think about, uh, Paul uses this picture, it's quoted from the Old Testament, he has led captivity captive. He has come to destroy the power of death, death and sin. You know, those are the greatest enemies of the Christian de described by the Apostle Paul. And Jesus came for the purpose of restoring life, doing away with sin, doing away with death, doing away with hell and the power that it had over the sinner because we were, we did have fault. We did rebel against God. But Jesus, having become our substitute, he defeats those enemies, hell, death, finally then sin in verse five and so ambrose calls upon us realizing purpose for which jesus came as that babe laid in the manger to live and to die as our substitute under the law of god to pay the debt that we owe for the justice of god to be served we raise the song of triumph and then the question that ambrose asks in verse five is we know that he's won the victory but why don't we see that? Why don't we see that fulfilled? Why do we still live in a world that's full of problems and trouble and sin and error and evil and wickedness? And he says, what, when, when are we going to see this glorious kingdom that you came to establish finally fulfilled, complete? And, and we're going to get into that answer then in the last two verses. But he, he ends that verse five with that simple question okay i believe that jesus came as my savior i believe that he's true god and true man but hey it sure doesn't look like he's accomplished anything yet when it when is this all when am i going to see the results of what jesus came to do and that's that's a question that a lot of people have really struggled with through 1600 years of history yeah definitely i like, i really like this hymn nathaniel i didn't really notice it until actually we kind of dug in and talked about it but i like the fact that it kind of takes us from the beginning like of jesus's process like it kind of takes us from advent into the present time and day right because it, it, it's it's telling jesus to come make here this home then he does come it's not by human flesh or blood but it's by god it's a wondrous birth and then from the father he came and then he's going to return him to him the same he's going to be in heaven enthroned that's going to be an awesome day we're going to sing praises and we're going to want to see that more fully and i think that that last line of of stanza five that you were talking about kind of it made me think of the comparison right when shall we its glory see you think of the the shepherds who were in the judean countryside and saw the the multitude of the heavenly hosts praising god and how glorious that must have been and that was just a little glimpse or like take you know the apostles on transfiguration and it, it's called just a glimpse of the glory and we're 
you know, we're, we're longing to see that day, especially when we live in this sin darkened world, we want to see that awesome, just un, just shadeless light of God, the father, God, the son in glory forever. We want to see that, but it's, it's not time yet. We're, it's not time for us to see the actual victory. He's won that comes later. Maybe it comes sooner for some of us, but he is still coming quickly, isn't he? Absolutely. And as we roll into the last two verses, we're going to see Ambrose come back to the meaning of all of this for us. He's going to answer that question, but he's also going to, he's going to point out why we still, 2,000 years later, continue to celebrate the birth of this little baby. Wondrous though it is, uh, what, what, again, why do, why do we do that year after year after year? Sure. So uh, we're going to read now verses six and seven together. Seven is kind of that traditional doxology, but obviously very appropriate. And, you know, always, it's not just a simple doxology. The fact that it's the Trinity is uh, very complex. So we'll combine those and let's read them now. Brightly doth thy manger shine. Glorious is its light divine. Let not sin or cloud this light. Ever be our faith thus bright. Praise to God, the Father sing. Praise to, the, to God, the Son, our King. Praise to God, the Spirit be ever and eternally. And kind of like I was saying, Nathaniel, it takes us from the beginning to the end. And then in verse 6 here, it kind of just, it summarizes everything. It kind of like takes stock of what's going on here, kind of puts the manger into perspective for us, if you will. Yeah, and, and this is one of those reasons, again, I think why it fits well in the Christmas section. Yeah, yeah. You know, we get that manger, we get the fulfillment. Yes, it's talking about the coming and what we're expecting as we're looking ahead to Christmas. So it works, it works with Advent too, but we're looking at the manger now. We see this wondrous child, the virgin's offspring, meek and mild. We see it laying there in the manger. And, you know, you see the pictures and the paintings of the manger scene, and you see this this lit up, beautiful light shining on the manger, you know, and, and it, it's it's all glorious. And and in reality, it wasn't quite like that. But by faith, the manger of Jesus is a glorious thing. And going back to the end of that fifth verse, where he had that, had that question, "When shall we its glory see?" Ambrose answers that question by saying, "As we struggle through." the difficulties and the darkness of this life, there's a temptation for those, those trials of life to bring the storm clouds in and to cover up the brightness of the meaning of Christ's birth for us. And he says, we can't let it do that. It, it shines through the troubles of this life. Let not sin or cloud this light, the hymn writer says, ever be our faith thus bright. And so the Christian faith goes back to the promises of God. We walk by faith, not by sight, we profess. And we don't always get to see the, the fulfillment in time. We look forward to the fulfillment in eternity, but we look back and see what God has already accomplished for us. And with the assurance of what he has done in the past, we know that he will also complete what he promises in the future. So like you said, verse six is a really beautiful summary verse. It kind of takes all of those things that we've talked about, the nature of Jesus as true God and true man, that he's the virgin son, the fulfillment of all of these Old Testament promises to, to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, to Abraham when he calls him out of Ur, all the way through the Old Testament, he takes us to the fulfillment for us today. We see that baby Jesus in the manger, and by faith, we know that no matter what struggles we will face in this life, Jesus comes as our savior to deliver us from this world of sin, to return, to take us to our heavenly home. And, and then in the last verse, we get to that beautiful doxology, so common, especially in the medieval hymns, mm -hmm. as we praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Again, think back to the history in the context of, of the 
Council of Constantinople, the errors regarding both the person of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is a beautiful, it's kind of a nail in the coffin uh, for, for the Arians and, and for those who are denying the, the Godhead of the Holy Spirit. And he just kind of shoves it out there and says, no, we profess our faith in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three ever and eternally. So a beautiful, beautiful summary. Right. I like, I really like the transition, I think, between verses five and verses six, you know, kind of verse five kind of le- leaves you hanging a little bit. When are we going to see the, this glory? And then verse six really addresses it. Um, of course, like, I don't know, how many references are there in the Bible to Jesus being light? Like many. <laughs> yes, yeah, so many. And of course, like the first one that jumps into my mind as we referenced several times here already is John 1 you know the light was the light of men and our life was the light of men and John bear, bore witness to that light um Jesus Christ being the light of the world that's a very common definite theme in Christmas and I, I like the way that it just kind of states it brightly doth the manger shine thy manger shine it's like it doesn't matter how dark things are for us now here in 2020 or how dark they've been for you personally at any point in your life that the darkness does not matter the absolute truth is the manger shines gloriously it doesn't matter how dark it is for us that's always the shining hope right that's that's the message of christmas is that now we have the manger to come to yeah this i mean this is one of the reasons why this is this is one of my favorite hymns not and I'll, i'm going to be honest here christmas hymns are not my favorite really uh, yeah, generally i find that they're really wishy-washy uh, but but this this is this is at the top of my list not only because of the ancient nature of it and understanding the history and the background in which it was written but it is deep in its its theology mm-hmm. as it emphasizes all of these beautiful things and and it sews together all of these promises from the Old Testament and its fulfillment in the New Testament uh, this is one of the the richest theologically richest hymns not only in the Christmas section but I. I I mean, this ranks right up there with hymns in the Lent section, which is by sure. far my favorite. Mm. Um, it very, very deep in its theology, and and yet simple. And that's what's neat about it, is it's it's simple enough that a child can understand it, but with a depth that the the most experienced theolo- uh, theologian can benefit from. And and it's hard to find a hymn like that. Yeah, yeah, it is really simple, isn't it? I mean. It's yeah, it's like faith, I guess. It's simple enough for a child to understand it, but it's deep enough that you can spend your whole life in study of it and still not fully grasp it. And even the tune, Nathaniel, it, it seems like it's there's not a lot going on. It's just it's just seven 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 seven. Like that's it. It's not super complex. I mean, I'm not exactly the person to, to tell you what tunes are and aren't complex, but it just it's just kind of it's kind of repetitive. But then it once you sing if you sing all seven stanzas then like the repetitive nature just kind of reinforces just how miraculous this is and how wondrous it all is and I, yeah it's definitely effective no matter what you think about it it definitely works and i mean if it's been working since 397 ad like it's, it's still working today it's definitely a great gift that we have been given in in this hymn of ambrose Uh, I think now we are going to listen to Savior of the Nations come.
Well, Nathaniel, do you have any closing thoughts for us here on uh, on Ham 95? Well, as I've pointed out, this is one of my favorites, and, and I think for good reason. You commented earlier on the, the melody. As we listen to that melody, you, you pointed out the simplicity of the melody also, not just the words, but the simplicity of the melody. And the melody comes from the medieval times, the Middle Ages, most likely a, a chant that were that was used in order to mm-hmm. sing this hymn. Luther paired it to these words. And, and as you sing it, you can feel that chant-like, very contemplative nature of the melody. It it's not just this happy-go-lucky Christmas hymn. It's it's rich. And it, it invites the singer, the person who's singing the hymn, to come deeper into the theology of Christmas with him as we, we enrich our understanding of what Christmas is, who Jesus was, what he came to accomplish. And so I think this is one of those cases where the melody just does a wonderful service to the words themselves and enriches the words through the richness of the melody. Yeah, I think when I... I think a good thing to think of, right, when you sit, when you first start singing this hymn, like perhaps you have an opportunity pretty soon here in your church services to sing Savior of the Nations Come. Think about that first line in the first stanza, Savior of the Nations Come. Like that's, that's like a absolute fact, right? Jesus is the Savior of the nations, but the nations is, you know, it's, it is universal justification, which is great because that tells me I am, you know, I know that I'm part of the world, so Jesus has saved me. But then that second part, make it personal, you know. Savior of the nations come, virgin son, make here thy home. Make my heart your home. I know you're the savior of the nations, but now I'm praying that you come and make my heart your home. And, of course, that's what that's what Christmas is all about is God coming down to us on our level and saying, I have loved you. I have saved you. You are now, you know, going to come with me in paradise. Just a a beautiful hymn, a beautiful tune, simple yet rich. I can't really ask for anything better to be sung at, at Christmas time. Thank you, Nathaniel, very much for taking us through this. We hope that you, the listener, have been uh, blessed and enriched spiritually by our discussion here. The Lord be with you. We invite you to join us every week for another episode of Burden and Blessing Podcast, where we will continue to proclaim Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior for sinners. Until next week, take comfort in the fact that God is your rock and ever-present help in trouble.